All right, so this is chapter 11, section two, called probability. Um, the learning objective is to find the probability of an event using theoretical, experimental, and simulation methods. That so that you guys know, definitely put this in your notes. So if there's one method, theoretical, experimental, or simulation that you do not understand at the end of this lesson, make sure we go back and look that up. Um, this is an important essential understanding. The probability of an impossible event is zero or zero percent. The probability of a certain event is one or hundred percent. Otherwise, the probability of an event is a number between zero and one, or a percent between zero and a hundred. When you gather data from observations, you can calculate an experimental probability. Each observation is an experiment or a trial. So let's put the definition for experimental probability in our notes. So we represent the probability as a capital P, and we put what we're finding the probability of in parentheses right next to the P. And for now, we're going to call it an event. So the probability of an event is equal to the number of times the event happens divided by the number of trials. All right, so let's look at the example problem. I don't want you to put this in your notes, but I do want you to put like that it in your notes. So finding an experimental probability of 60 vehicles in the teacher's parking lot today, 15 are pickup trucks. What is the experimental probability that a vehicle in the lot is a pickup truck? So they got probability of a pickup. Probability of a pickup truck is equal to the number of pickup trucks divided by the number of vehicles. That's 15 over 60. That's 0.25 or 25%. The probability that a vehicle in the lot is a pickup truck is 0.25. So let's try this. A softball player got a hit 20 of the last 50 times at bat. What is the experimental probability that she will get a hit in her next at bat? So we've got the probability of a hit is equal to the number of times it has occurred, and that's 20, out of the total number of trials, that's 50. So 20 divided by 50 is 0 0.4, 40%. And and I know in baseball, when you're batting, they call it batting 400. I don't know why 40%. I would be saying batting 40, but uh, that's my math break. Um, but that's a pretty good batting average. Okay, so that was um, even um, using. So if we look at our learning objectives, um, experimental. So the next one we're going to explore is simulation. So simulation is a model of the event. A simulation is a model of the event. So your book gives you a little way you can use your graphing calculator to do the random integer output. So if you have a graphing calculator, you can follow these steps. So what they did is they used the random integer to um, generate a 1, a 2, a 3, or a 4, and they did that a number uh, about 10 times. And then they wanted to know what's the probability of getting three ones out of those four, three ones out of the ten trials. So out of the ten 
trials, they only got three ones. Oh, I didn't put the original problem on there. All right, so here's the original problem. On a multiple choice test, each item has four choices, but only one choice is correct. How can you simulate guessing the answers? So, um, what is the probability that you will pass the test by guessing at least six of ten answers correctly? So, the strategy is you're going to have a random numbers generated ten different times. And if you let one through four represent your four choices, and then let the number one represent the correct choice. So if you get a number one, that's correct. If you get a two, three, four, four, incorrect. So the probability is that you will pass the test by guessing at least six of the ten answers correctly. So we want to get a six. Um, so if you look at the first trial, they got three, four, three, one, four, two, one, two, one, two. So they only got three ones. So this first test, we scored 30%. That's not a, a pass. So then you do it, so you have nine in, in this case, they did it 20 times, so they had a 20 trial. And out of the 20, only one of them, one out of 20, had a passing test. So that is a 5% chance that you're going to get a passing grade if you guess on test. So what, um, what I wanted to do was to show you guys, um, if you did not have a graphing calculator, how you can do a random integer operation. So you go to random.org, and this one is random.org slash integers. And so if we want to reproduce the scenario we had, we want 10 integers to represent the um, 10 possible questions, and I want them to be between 1 and 4 to represent A, B, C, or D, and um, just format into one columns. So let's go get the numbers. So here's our first trial, so we write these down. Here's our second trial. Here's our third trial. Fourth trial fifth trial. I'm looking for any of them that have more than, have seven, uh, sorry, six ones. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 16, 17, 18, 19, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 20. So we did, we just now did 20 trials, and we got no <coughs> passing tests in those 20 trials. So, boo. Um, so in problem two, what is the probability of, pass, uh, if, of passing if a passing score is 50% or better. So we want the scenarios where there are five ones, so we just count. I'll highlight it in blue. So one, two, three, four, five, this one. This one. Three, that's one. This one. Too bad 50% is not a passing score. It's really too bad. And okay, so out of our 20 trials, our percentage is up to 1, 2, 3, 4. So instead of 1 out of 20, it is 4 out of 20. 
and 4 divided by 20 is 2 tenths, so it's 20%. Yes, it's 20%. 20%. Or 0.2. So even if passing is 50%, it only ups your probability of passing 15% um, if you reduce. All right, so let's write these, these definitions down because it's kind of a new vocab for us. The set of all possible outcomes to an experiment or activity is called a sample space. It's like taking a sampling. And I know this looks funny, but when each outcome in a sample space has the same chance of occurring, the outcomes are equally likely outcomes. All right, so now, so we did the... Um, So now we're going to move on to theoretical probability. So let's write that definition down. If a sample space has n equally likely outcomes and an event A occurs in m of these outcomes, then the theoretical probability of event A, which is written as P for probability of event A, is equal to M divided by N. I like to think of it as the number of desired outcomes divided by the total possible outcomes. So if we look at problem three, I don't want you to write it down. It's just for your eyeballs because we'll do the got it together. What is the theoretical probability of each event getting a five? on one roll of a standard number cube, also known as a die. So if you look at a number cube, there are six possible outcomes. You get a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. The t number five occurs once in that scenario. So the probability of rolling a five is one out of six. Now let's look at when I have two dice, two dice, getting a sum of five on one roll of two standard number cubes. So I'm rolling two dice at the same time. There are 36 possible equally likely outcomes because it's six on one, six on the other, fundamental counting principle says we multiply those two together to get 36. So there's 36 possible outcomes. I want you to write this down. We're just looking for more. Yeah, you're going to write down three. So the probability that you're going to end up with a sum of five, if you look, you can get a one and a four. You can get a two and a three. You can get a three and a two. And you can get a four and a one. So there are four different possible ways you can get a sum of five out of 36 possible outcomes. And when you reduce that down, it's one out of nine. All right, so let's look at number three together. What is the theoretical probability? So let's write this out in math speak of getting a sum that is an odd number on one roll of two standard cubes. So let's look at, I know that I have 36 total outcomes. And let's start looking at a number, the number cubes. So I can have a one and, I can, uh, and then an even, uh, even number, so three. Uh, sorry, one and two. I have one and two. When we add those together, it's three. I can have a one and four. I can have a one and six. 
So there's three for sure. How about uh, two? We have two and one. I can have two and three. And two and five. Okay, what about three? Three plus two? About three plus four. And three and six. Okay, what about four? Four and one. Four and three. Four and five. And then lastly, I have five. Five and two. Five and four. Five and six. So then I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then what about 6? So the 6 is up here. 6 and 1. 6 and 3. 6 and 5. So for each, I get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So 18 out of 36. I know my math on that. That's one half. What is the odd? So that's 0.5 or 50%. Without calculating the probability, is it more likely to get an even or an odd number on one roll of a standard number cube? And explain. So for B, I'm not going to calculate the probability, but how many even numbers do we have on one cube? And how many odd numbers do we have it's, it's not any more likely to get an even number as it is an odd number. Okay, so now we're going to bring section 1 colliding with section two. So we're going to use combinations to find the probability. What is a theoretical probability of being dealt exactly two sevens in a five card hand from a standard deck of two cards? So this is just important information. Some of you guys are not card sharks like me. So um, some people don't know that a standard 52 card deck has four sweeps, hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. Each suit contains cards numbered 2 through 10, and an ace, jack, queen, and king. So when you look at the original problem, two sevens, the number of combinations of two sevens from a total of four in the deck. So you want four, choose two. And the number of combinations of three, so you have two sevens and then three other random cards. So we're looking at a couple different scenarios. So you've got the scenario where you have the seven, so you have two sevens in your hand. Then you have to have the scenario where you have three non-sevens. And so you, since you've already have four sevens, Total, that's where the 48 comes from. There are four sevens in a deck. That leaves 48 other cards, and you're going to choose three of those. Okay. The number of five card hands with two sevens, four choose two, and then the other three we don't care about, 48 choose three. So you multiply those two together, 
and we're going to divide that by the number of possible five card hands. So that's 52 cards and we're going to choose five. So you take your two scenarios, choosing two sevens, and choosing three others, and multiply those two together and divide by the total. All right, now let's try this with another. What is the theoretical probability of being dealt all four sevens in a five card hand? So that changes our, our card scenario. Probability of hand with four sevens. Not 40 sevens, four sevens. So we are out of our four sevens. We're choosing all four. That leaves out of the other 48 cards, we're just choosing one because we have five card hand. Four in the first one, one in the second one. And then we're going to divide it by all the possible five card combinations. Okay. So. Because I want to, this is how I'm going to save myself a little bit of time. Let's go back to that combination calculator. So the first combination I want to calculate is 4 choose 4. So let's put a one for this one. And then 48 choose one. Is 48. And then 52 choose 5. We actually don't have to calculate that because it's right here. Awesome. And then let's actually calculate that those items together. So I'm going to go 48 divided by 2, 5, 9, 8, 9, 6, Zero equals. Oh my goodness, they're very tiny. They're very tiny. 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5 equals 9. So that is 0 0.0124. Three, four, five. So it is point zero 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 one eight or point zero zero one eight percent. So very small chance you're gonna be dealt all four sevens in one hand. All right. So, one thing we need to talk about is geometric probability, and that's when we compare the areas. So, the total area of what we're interested in to um, the total possible area. And in this scenario, we got a batter, and the strike zone depends on the height and stance of a batter. What is the geometric probability that a baseball thrown at random within the batter's strike zone? will be a high inside strike, one of the hardest pitches to hit. So what we've done is we've, to answer this question, you find the area of the high inside strike, which is this whole square, 
in red, so it's 4 inches times 6 inches, which is 24. And then divide it by the area of the total strike zone, which is 17 inches for this guy. 17 inches times 22 inches. When we do that, it is a 0 0.064 or 6.4%. So let's do this um, for a same scenario, but a little bit different numbers. Our pattern is, um, so suppose the batter strike zone is 15 by 20. That the high inside strike is 3 by 5. So what's the probability that a baseball will be thrown at random within the strike zone will be a high inside strike. So we go 5 times 3 divided by 20 times 15. So it's 15 out of 300. So that's 15 divided by 300. It's 0 0.05 or 5%. So you just take your area, what you're interested in, and divide it by the total area possible. Safe.